Okay. All righty. Um, we start today in Job chapter 20. Job chapter 20. Now, just kind of get our minds back to where it was moments ago or last week. As you read Job chapter 19, he is um, giving his answer to Bildad. And toward the end of it, he, he's, he's emphasizing, you know, and I mean, he really tells him in verse 29, do you be afraid of the swords for yourself? Don't you worry about me. Don't you worry about what I'm going through. Don't you sit there and, and judge me because of what I'm going through. You be aware of the, of the sword that yourself, the wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know that there's a judgment. So you're judging me. You're judging me. So what needs to happen now is you yourself need to be aware of this. So now, Zophar again speaks. And again, he has given us, uh, Job has given a dire warning as to what was going on. And this is going to be the last speech Zophar makes. And it's, it's a very severe, it's a very severe speech in every sense of the term. I mean, it's, it's going to be a tough one. Um, so as we look at this, he he gives the reasons why, chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, the reasons why he feels compelled to speak. And then again, as we look at this a little further, he denounces Job as a hypocrite and as a wicked man in verse 5, verse 12, verse uh, 19, verse 29. Hello, Josh. Good to see you, buddy. Glad you're here with us. Glad you're here with us. And so he prophesies not only that, but he also prophesies a violent death for Job. In other words, the destruction of his house and the rising up as it was of heaven and earth itself as a witness against him. So let's see what he's got to say. Now, notice verses one through three, as I said, Zophar has to say something. Every one of these guys feel, uh, feel compelled to say something. We understand that and I've made this point over and over again as we've gone through the book of Job, the best thing they could have done was exactly what they were doing to begin with, just be quiet. But when Job begins to speak, they now feel like they have the right to speak, and this is where it goes. And every one of their accusations gets worse and worse and worse. And so just kind of picture that in your mind. What does he say? He says, do my thoughts cause me to answer? He says, my anxious thoughts make me answer because of the turmoil within me. I've heard the rebuke that reproaches me and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. So what's he saying? I've heard your rebuke. I've heard what you've said against me. And he says, the haste, he has, says in the English Standard Version, I hear censure that insults me. He emphasizes that idea. And he says, do you not know this from old, or excuse me, and out of my understanding, a spirit answers me. I've heard the rebuke. The spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. So again, he's heard the harsh reproof of Job. He said, I've got to say something. And again, that's, that's been the tragedy of this whole story. And they've all got to say something to try to figure out what's going on. God's going to speak before it's all over with. And I, I can't wait. We're going to slow down a lot whenever we look at God, what God says so that we can see, as he's talking about it, we can see and emphasize the idea of what he stresses. And so then he says this. He says, you know, I'm taking this personally because as far as I'm looking at it, Job, you are a sinner and you are trying to tell me that I'm not righteous. And I can tell you that I know you're not righteous, but it's mainly because of what you're going through. So you see, this is where they're, they're coming. So I've heard you reproach me and my friends. Again, look at every one of the answers Job gives in the first cycle of speeches, the second cycle of speeches. And he says, the spirit just causes me to answer. I, there's a violent answer, agitation. I've got to say something. Have we ever been in a situation where we feel like we've got to say something? I think so a lot of times. And sometimes as, as you read through the book of Proverbs, especially, you'll see that God is trying to emphasize time and time and time again the idea that the best thing for us to do sometimes is just to be quiet. But whenever we get riled up, whenever we hear words that attack us, whenever we feel like that everybody else is wrong and we're right, we just got to let somebody know. And sometimes the best thing to do is just to be quiet. Oh, that we would learn that lesson. Oh, that I would learn that lesson. 
So think about that in that respect. Now, beginning in verses 4 through 29, he again, as he has done up to this point in time, he again tries to stress the idea that the calamity Job is going through in his life is just the lot. It's just what wicked men should understand that's going to be a part of their lives. So we begin in verses four and five. Hold on just a second. Let me shut the door so I won't be disturbed or you won't, I won't disturb somebody else. I'll be right back. That was quick enough, I hope. <laughs> it, it shouldn't have taken me too long, but there, there you go. Yeah, that was, that was are you on 15? Do what now? Are you on 15? No, we're starting in chapter 20. Oh, you okay. Yeah, okay. Chapter 20. Uh, we finished up uh, last week uh, from 15 to 19. As I said, I'm kicking it in the higher gear now, trying to get through the rest of the book. So that's part that's of it. And that's fine. That's fine. I, and listen, Josh, I would forget too, but I make notes in my notes where I've got to start. Well, <laughs> well, I was, I was using, I think I was doing it online. That's why I wasn't using the Bible. So I didn't mark it. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're good. So we're starting in chapter 20 and again, chapter 20, verse four, five, he says this, do you not know this of old since man is placed on the earth that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. So here's his point. You know, the wicked are always going to be struck with sudden calamity. Joe, you're in this situation, and you should not be surprised that it happened to you. This has always happened to old to folks in the old time. Think about those that were punished. Think about Adam and Eve. Were they punished the moment they had committed the sin? Yes. We remember going back and reading about what Adam and Eve, and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden, could not have the relationship with God that they had to begin with. And the reason was, again, was because of their, their sin. Think about Cain and Abel. In the moment Cain had killed his brother Abel, God again said something to him, and he had a mark. We're not sure exactly what that is. We're not going to uh, try to find out. There's no way that we can really know. But he had a mark placed upon him. Nobody else was going to touch him. He was just going to have to live with that for the rest of his life. Go through Scripture all the time in the Old Testament, and you see Time and time again, how God's judgment falls very quickly on some and not so quickly on others. David, when he committed the sin with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, then that child was born dead. So there is that pattern that you see. So Zophar is making the argument from that pattern that when calamity comes, it obviously is because of some sin in that particular person's life. So since the creation, this has been the case, and somebody says, I'm going to say this to you as well, uh, the triumphing of the wicked is short. In other words, you can't rejoice or have victory or declare yourself to be rejoice in that. No, you're going to have to pay the punishment. And that's what he's saying. And, and again, the way they're looking at things, that's, that, there's biblical examples. There is Bible passages that seem to suggest these very ideas. So I think, again, part of the reason why God allowed the book of Job to be written was to emphasize to us that not every case is the same. God's always going to do what's best in whatever the situation is, and not every case is going to be the same. So, you know, Psalms 37, 35, and 36. Psalms 51, where David is lamenting the loss of his son with him and Bathsheba because of what he had done. Uh, Psalm 72, 17 through 19. The idea that he says here, the triumph of the wicked is short, the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. There again is that parallelism. He's saying the same thing again, different words, different terms. He talks about the joy of the hypocrite. Think about the idea that sometimes the hypocrites do rejoice. Um, suppose uh, if you were sitting on death row, and you get a letter of pardon. Well, man, you're going to sit there and say, wow, all right, I've been pardoned. But then you find out later what? It's forged. <laughs> so that's, that's not going to bring you any comfort in the, in the long haul. And so, by de huh? Hey, by definition, hypocrite means that you're living in sin, but you're pointing the finger at someone else. 
in a lot of situations, it depend on it depends on the context. Hupokrates means the the ideal of, of judging. Obviously, you do that, and you wind up doing the same things that you're judging others over and over again. Jesus called the Pharisees hypocrites. Why? They claimed to be religious people. They were doing everything that they needed to be doing for the temple worship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They would judge everybody else in a harsh manner when sometimes maybe these other people would be doing the same thing. Yeah. And so you come to Matthew 23 in Jesus' last public sermon before he died upon the cross, he cries out for the last time to those people. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and count how many times he does that in Matthew 23. So we look at it from the viewpoint of play acting. That's what you're doing. You're play acting. You're acting at this. So the as, as Zophar is looking at it, and Job is suffering, and he's saying that he's not guilty, but now you're playing the hypocrite, Job, because we can see that you are because of everything you're going through. And that's kind yeah. of what he's looking at it. So now you have the also not only the accusations of the sins that they think he's committed, but now, Job, we think you're playing a hypocrite on top of everything else. And Job is saying, that's not the case. I'm not acting. I'm not trying to sit back and say that I'm righteous when I'm not. He's saying, in essence, what? I'm, this is what I want. I'm going through. This is not me playing. This is, this is honest. This is earnest stuff. So he goes on to verse six and seven, though his haughtiness mounts, notice the word haughtiness, that suggests the ideal of what? Haughtiness is the ideal of excellency, the ideal of, of you think you're above everybody else and his head reaches to the clouds, yet he will per per perish forever like his own refuse. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? So again, he's just trying to bring out you, your excellency. They go to the highest point of honor and prosperity, as high as a man can reach. One who is greatly exalted and has reached up. Your head has reached up to the clouds. You know, again, this is reference not, well, it is specifically to Job, but he's describing the hypocrite here. Yet he shall perish forever like his own dung, like, and again, what is it? And the King James, New King James says his own dung is, we understand what that means. He's being very blunt about it. And he says, he, he and as it says, you will perish with his own refuse. And then those who have seen him will say, where is he? What, what happened to him? He was so high and now he is so low that he's off. It appears like he's off the face of the earth. That's the way of the hypocrite. And Job, you're the hypocrite. Notice, he will fly away like a dream and not be found. Yes, he will be chased away like a vision of the night. And he says, fly away as a dream. What happens to dreams? They vanish, right? How many of us dream at night? Probably most of us, depending on what we're going through in our lives, how tired we are, things along that line. How many of us remember the dreams a lot of times? Uh, some of the dreams can wake us up, scare us. Sometimes they become very, very vivid, but probably, again, as, as we understand that whole idea is whenever you awake, you don't remember any part of it. You don't remember anything that goes on there. You know that maybe something, it was something that was there, but you can't even remember the details of it. And he says, that's it. He shall be chased away than a night. And the ideal is, is notice, he says, um, he will be chased away like a vision of the night, a phantasm, a ghost, all right? So he's saying, mm -hmm. what, what's he emphasizing? He's saying, um, it's more than a dream. It's kind of like a ghost. That's how the wicked man is. Here one minute, gone the next. Job, all we're trying to get you to do is repent. But you refuse to do it because you have to say that you've not done anything wrong. But Lord, or Job, don't you understand? And don't you grasp the idea that, that you shall be like that ghost? One day here, the next day gone. Everything you have here, next day, everything gone. You're, that's, that's the way you are. You're like a ghost. You're not going to be around much longer. You're going to just be it. That's going to be it. And then he says, his children will seek the favor of the poor. And his hands will restore his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. So 
you know, there's two possible reasoning or thinking here. His children will try to curry favor with the poor. All righty. Yeah, it will seek the favor of the poor. His children are trying to seek the favor of the poor. Um, some other translations put the poor actually, what, oppress his children. Even his kids shall reduce themselves to asking aid from the poor. This is what's going to happen. Now, again, he's speaking in broad terms. I don't think he's specific, speaking specifically to Job in his situation because what's happened, he's lost all his children anyway. And he's just saying, this is the way it's always been. This is the way it will always be. And so just understand this, his hand shall restore his goods. Uh, his wealth, his bones shall be full of vigor. Okay. Now the King James version said his bones shall be full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in but dust. The King James says his bones are full of the sin of his youth and shall lie down with him in the butt in the, in the dust. So his no, bones have no sign of weakness or decay, but he would be cut off in his youth. Well, again, think about this. He's making broad accusations because Job is older and so he can't say and make that apl application necessarily to him, but he's just, he's trying to say, look, this is what happens when a person sins. This is what they have to go through. Okay. Though evil is sweet in his mouth. Now it kind of shifts gear a little bit. Though evil is sweet in his mouth and he hides it under his tongue, though he spares it and does not forsake it, yet <clears throat> still keeps it in his mouth. His food and his stomach turn sour. It becomes cobra venom with him. He swallows down riches and vomits them up again, and God casts them out of his belly. So the wicked man, he says, has pleasure in the fact that he's committed sin. There are some people that love to commit sin, and they will do it over and over and over again, and they will dare anybody to say anything to them about it. You know, you've got to hear the bad news before you will ever listen to the good news. And the thing is, is he said he has pleasure committing sin. As he talks about it, he says, hides it under his tongue. He is, it's like he's tasting it and, you know, rolling it around in his mouth. It's like something that's good to eat. And he wants to just roll it around in his mouth and get all the flavor and everything out of it. He said, that's the way it is with a sinner. A sinner sins, he eats, he rolls it around in his mouth. He's doing all of this. And so he hides it under his tongue and, and he's just prolonging every bit of it. And so again, he continues to sin. He continually, as it was, verse 13, he continually still keeps it in his mouth. Yet his food and his stomach turn sour. Uh, the bottom line is, is the sin that might taste so good when it gets down into the inner part of man, it makes him sick. Job, think about where you are right now. You're sick. You're suffering from these boils, this elephantiasis you're scraping yourself you have enjoyed your life of sin and now it's making you sick literally so you see this as you're looking at it you can see how it does apply to in, in one sense it does apply to those that are wicked but again judgment doesn't come immediately upon them in Job's specific case he's looking at Job and, and saying this is the way you are You've enjoyed it. You haven't confessed it. It's now made you sick. And you're still being so stubborn that you won't admit to what you've done. And that's what he's trying to bring out. You know, it's like, again, it goes on and he says, it's like what? It's, he swallowed, it's like, it becomes like cobra venom within him. Okay. You know, some poisonous snakes, the moment they bite, they have so much poison, it automatically starts to kill a person. I mean, immediately. Uh, I've seen pictures, you probably have too, on YouTube and some other places where they take blood, human blood, and then put, a, I mean, just a very small amount of rattlesnake venom in it, and it immediately clots up. And that's what happens in our bodies whenever we're bit, you know, by a rattlesnake or something like that. We uh, The blood starts to clot. It starts to shut air. Again, with the clots, you start having all these problems that's you're not going to make it and if you have that antivenin in just the in the best time you know in the best moment of time it is think about that because again he's going to say and mention that again in verse 16 
He swallows down riches and vomits them up again. God casts them out of his belly. So it's God who's done this to you, Job. And this is what you need to understand. God is at the center of it. God will cause the remorse. And God will cause the wicked man to restore what he will, has taken. So again, the engaging in the sin is sucking the poison of a dangerous snake. Uh, you know, uh, why, why is he saying it again? Why is he saying it again? The, the cobra, the viper's tongue. Why is he saying it again? It's repeat, 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 repeat. Hopefully, if I repeat myself enough, <laughs> you'll get it, Joe. Hopefully, if I keep telling you that you're a sinner and that you need to repent, you will repent. But again, it's going to be dependent upon you. It's going to be dependent upon you. Now, we go on a little bit down, a little further. He will not see the streams, the rivers flowing with honey and cream. He will restore that which he labored, will not swallow it down. The proceeds of business, he will get no enjoyment. He has oppressed the, and forsaken the poor. Now notice, here's getting very specific again about what kind of sins Job has committed. When we get to Job chapter 29, Job is going to talk. And he's going to give from Job chapter 29 through 31, a long speech that talks about all the things he's done to help others. They probably before all of this happened would have admitted to all of that. But Job has to literally tell them all the good deeds he's done to show them that again, he did not deserve this. And then as we listen to Job's final speech, then God finally speaks. And again, that's where we want to spend a lot of time as we come into it next. Look in verse, uh, he that restored that for which is labored, he has uh, forsaken the oppressed, Again, this is the first time this insinuation is brought against Job. Um, Eliaphaz said it back in, and again in 22 verses 5 through 9. Job will deny it in 29, chapter 29, verses 11 through 17. So again, he has violently taken away the house which he did not build. Um, and, and again, he's emphasized he's done it in an underhanded way. Think about the idea of so many times today. People. We'll get a mortgage on a house. And um, if they're not being very careful, if they're not dotting their I's or crossing their T's, uh, if they don't have an attorney perhaps there to help them to sign off on the papers, then somehow or another that person that sold the house or that holds the mortgage, if he decides that he really wants the house, if they did find out that that house is now worth 10 times what he sold it for, then he will do whatever he has to do to get that money because it's all about the money. Could it be again that he's accusing Job of that? The idea today, somebody takes a mortgage, forecloses on it, and, and then has the property for himself at a little or nothing. He says that, that man, he who has violently seized a house, which he did not build, that man needs to be punished. And we will all say together, amen. Amen. That's right. That's the way it ought to be. So Job, obviously, if you've lost all of this, then here you go. Here you go. In verse 21, nothing is left for him to eat. Well, of course, Job couldn't eat that much anyway, because he was sick and he didn't feel like it. Again, it could be mean the idea that the wicked man has oppressed so many different ways that there's nothing left for him to devour. Again, we go back to Matthew 23, where he would say, roll unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because a lot of them were doing the very same thing that here Zophar is accusing of Job. And so he says, what? There's nothing left for him to eat. His well-being will not last. In his self-sufficiency, notice there again, there's, some, there's another implied sin there. What is it? Job, you're trusting yourself. You're not trusting God. You trust in what you can do. And we have to understand, and I think we should be more honest about this, that what we have, what we own, what we enjoy does come from God. And we need to always rejoice in the fact that God is with us and is taking care of us and is blessing us in all the ways that he has. So could it again be making the accusation to 
Job, Job, look, uh, the problem with you is that you've not honored God with what you need to. In his self-sufficiency, he will be in distress. Every hand of mercy or misery will come against him. So, Job, you again brought all this on you. You're going to find yourself in difficulties. Every hand of the wicked will come upon you, the wretched, again. All those whom have had property stolen for them will rise up and scatter that man's substance upon over the earth. And he says, when he is about to fill his belly, verse 23, he then says, God will cast on him the fury of his wrath, and it will rain it on him who is eating. So it seems like, again, the, the moment, that moment in time, God will cast all of this when he's about to fill his belly, when the wicked man is about to launch that fresh attack upon the poor, God will attack and punish that man for what he's done. So again, Job, here you are suffering. Look at what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. What do you think? Have you mistreated somebody that you held a mortgage on their house? Do you think God's going to let you get away with it? Again, they're grasping at straws. Job never did anything like that. Again, when we get to chapter 29, we'll see what Job has to say about all of this very specifically. So he says, <clears throat> then he says, uh, verse 22, okay, verse 22, 23, God will cast on him the fury of his wrath and will rain on him while he is eating. So God's going to punish him at that moment in time. And that's just it. He will flee from the iron weapon, from the iron weapon. Um, some people, they had iron at that time. Then the word bronze bow. If you're looking in the King James Version, the bronze there is translated bows of steel. Well, they didn't have steel back then. They didn't have steel mills and things along that line. But the bronze, uh, the bronze bow, a lot of times they would make that and it would be part of the bow and arrow. And that's what they were emphasizing there. Uh, so again, you're, be Job, you're being punished for what you've done. It is drawn. The bow is drawn and comes out the body. The glittering point comes out of his gall. The arrow goes all the way through you. That's where you are right now. That's why you're suffering, Job. God has took, taken this arrow and struck it in you. And now that's the reason why you're suffering and in such pain and, and struggling with everything you're doing, you're, 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 you would, again, watch the cowboy and Indian movies. And whenever the, one of the cowboys gets shot with an arrow, he reaches for it, you know, and either tries to pull it out or, you know, and again, as you're also seeing how they try to doctor it, a lot of times they'll push the arrow on through. And you know what I'm trying to say? That's, I, I see that vividly in the, in the cowboy idea. Think about the idea that as he tries to pull it out or as he tries to suffer with it, you know, all you've got to look forward to, Job, is death. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's all you've got to look forward to, to have death, so that what? Um, it'll all be over. It'll all be over. The word uh, all, sorry, brother. Go ahead, brother. What, what, I, what I find fascinating is, and almost comical, is how they are telling Job that, okay, this is the reason, right? Even even if Job had sinned in a way that deserved that, they mm -hmm. can't play God and then say, "This is why you are suffering." It says if they they are just prepared to stand in the presence of God, and then it, regardless of what Job says, it does matter. They are telling Job, "This is the reason," and 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 clearly, uh, he is being haughty. He's being presumptuous, he's standing in the place of God and then, you know, assuming that he's right. Yeah, and that's the way they look at it. Before it's all over with, they're going to come to a definite, clear understanding that that's not been the case. Um, but again, think about it at the same time as they're talking about arrows flying through your body. Every one of their words are arrows flying through his conscience, through, flying through his hurt. So it's not only that he's hurting physically, emotionally, and struggling with what God is doing here, but now his friends are hurting. And they're the ones shooting the arrows. 
And, and so no wonder he comes back in a lot of situations in, in very, I won't say violent language, but I would say just hurting even that much more. I can't find anybody he's saying that's really listening to what I'm saying, nor can I find anybody to bring me any comfort because everybody's what? Making these assumptions. And as I've tried to stress all through this time and time and time again, we all need to be very careful when we make assumptions about people. When we've not walked the road they've walked, when we've not seen the things they've seen, when we've not done the things they've done, we need to be very careful and, and try not to automatically jump to a conclusion somewhere down the line. Um, and that's, I think, is one of the great takeaways of this. Um, when somebody dies, young, uh, again, a lot of times, what do we think? Well, what did they die from? Uh, was it was it an overdose? Was it uh, AIDS? Was it hopefully not in the in the midst of a crime? Do what now? Hopefully not in the midst of a crime. Not in the midst of a crime, but a lot of people do make a lot of assumptions, don't we? And, and we need to be again. Jesus will say, John 7, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And part of the problem with that is sometimes is we've not walked in their shoes. We've not been there where they've been. So how could we really propose a judgment upon that person when we've not been there and done that? And, and again, well, don't, you think, don't, don't you think all of those guys have sinned, though? I, I think they all have. I think Joe so was, how would they be like looking down on him like that? Yeah, well, that's the, but that's the irony of it. They are they are sinning by playing God, right? And and ironically, that Job is the one. In fact, uh, I don't want to go ahead of you, brother. But at the end of the book, Job is is going to have to pray for them. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's and that's that's the ironical thing, like you said about it, in the fact that they can't see that they too have sinned in trying to take God's place and trying to tell him this is what God has done because, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying a moment ago, we as humans can become very haughty, very proud. I mean, we are talking, we're talking through computers on the internet, you know, and we, we pat ourselves on the back about, look what our technology has done but our technology and everything else has not solved the problem of war. Think about Russia and Ukraine right now. It's not solved the problem of peace or it's not given us the answer to peace. On and on and on it goes. We claim that we're very smart, very intelligent people. A lot of people nowadays will dismiss the Bible because they say, well, that's just an old book written back, back in those days. And yet within it, gives us the real moral compass that we need to get to where we need to go. So it is vitally important that we be very careful about when we talk to others, but it's also very important that we be very careful about making sure we're studying and, and trying to un not speak things for God that are not necessarily true, but try to learn the things from God that he has revealed to us in his word so that we don't jump into a problem a situation and start doing like his friends are doing and again so often and i've said this before we men want to solve people's problems we want to be problem solvers and a lot of times you can't solve people's problems they've got to solve them themselves you can help encourage but there comes a point where you can only do so much they got to take responsibility for their own lives and that's that's part of it as well. So thank you for your exact exact points there. All right. So uh, we're at verse um, uh, twenty. Where did I get to? Yeah, self sufficiency, the hand of misery. When he is about to fill his stomach, God will cast on him the fury of his wrath, and will rain on him while he is eating. Again, God is going to attack him just as he's filling himself up with himself. Isn't that often the case too? Whenever we're full of ourselves, we 
do things that we normally maybe would not do. And then they do come back on us and, and really make us pay big time because maybe we made, again, some mistakes in our assumptions. We didn't have all the facts. We didn't have all that's necessary. So then we go ahead and make a decision. And then it comes back to, as we often say, it's comebacks to bite us. So again, it's the same thing here. You know, he said, God will pour down his wrath upon this and that's going to be his man's food. So Zophar is purposefully selecting these words so that Job will see the sin that he's in. Verse 24, he will flee from the iron weapon. A bronze bow will pierce him through. We've talked about that. Verse 25, it is drawn, comes out of his body. And again, his terrors are upon him. We discussed that. Verse 26, total darkness is reserved for his treasures. Again, everything is, is darkness in this book. Now, a lot of times through the Bible, darkness suggests the ideal of, of sin. It suggests the idea of eternal darkness. And again, that's one of those things that we really struggle with. We, we look in the Bible when he talks about the description of hell and we talk about a place that's burning with fire and brimstone. Fire always puts out light. And yet at the same time, we find that description sometimes is a place of outer darkness, right? So I think both figures are used to talk about a place of punishment, talk about a place of, of horror. So here in this situation, again, all these darkness shall be there. Zophar is telling Job that he's treasuring up these calamities. Look, Job, this is what, this is, it's rever, reserved for his treasures. An unfanned fire will consume him. It shall go ill with him who is left in his tent. He's going to lose everything he's got but he's also going to lose his life. And then verse 27, the heavens will reveal his iniquity. The earth will rise up against him and the increase of his house will depart. His goods will flow away in the day of his wrath. This is the portion from God for a wicked man, the heritage appointed to him by God. Now let's kind of go through these things. Number one, verse 27, the heavens shall reveal his iniquity. Again, it seems like heaven and earth is rising up against this person for what he has done. He, that person might try to attempt to conceal his sin. This is what they've been thinking that Job has been doing all along. But in some way, heaven and earth will be brought out against him, and it's going to show everyone who he is and what manner of man that he was. Again, think about the book of Exodus. Be sure that your sin will what? Find you out. So there is something to be said about that. So again, this seems to be Zophar's answer to Job's assertion that uh, the heaven and earth will vindicate his cause. And Zophar is saying, no, heaven and earth is going to show what you've done wrong. And we're just waiting for it to happen. I think, again, the pride comes into play, the assumptions come into play, and the bitterness because Job has been so harsh against them. So now they're just really taking it out on him. And they're not helping. They're hurting. The increase of his house shall depart. His goods shall flow away. Again, his children, his goods, everything's going to be gone in the days of God's wrath. And again, we see that that's what's going on. And he says, verse 29, this is the portion of the wicked man from God, the heritage appointed by him. Again, it's similar to the conclusion of Bildad's speech in chapter 18, verse 21. So Bildad has said it, Zophar said it. Both of them are wanting to apply them to apply Job or Job to apply this. And so this is just the way it's going to be. So again, in all of this, he's indignant, indignant because Job has not followed their advice. And Job begins like he did again. Here we come again. I want you to notice the speeches are getting a little shorter. Job's speech at the first was two chapters long. Now it's getting down to one chapter. And a lot of times these chapters are getting shorter and shorter and shorter because what's beginning to happen is as the go between goes back and forth, they're saying all that's been said. A lot of times they repeat themselves. And finally, everybody's wore out talking. And God speaks. And God has the answer. And God will praise Job. 
for the fact that Job was faithful and did do what's right. But at the same time, he will also remind Job, you weren't here when I created the heavens and the earth. You weren't here when I created you. <laughs> you know, you weren't here and you made everything the way that I made it. You, you weren't here, Job. So yes, Job, you need to repent. But you also need to, as the brother said earlier, you need to be praying for your friends who have not said the right things about me. So all of these principles has been argued from one major idea, the wicked suffer in this life and the righteous prosper. And again, in our minds, that's true because we do seem like it seems that way. They all three, all three of his friends believe this point. Job in some places has emphasized the same idea. And so in a sense, you might could say that this, they consider this argument is settled, but in this chapter, now Job is going to take on the major issue. He's going to really talk about this in this respect. He's going to attack with vengeance this idea that all the wicked suffer. And so it's after this reply, we're going to enter this last cycle of speeches. What's well, also... Brother, okay. brother uh, sir, sir, what I also find is that none of, so far as God is concerned, none of them... Uh, can escape. You have the three friends that are more guilty than Job, mm -hmm. but where Job um, seemed to agree with the principle, God had to say, no, you're not God. You didn't form the earth. You don't know why, how the clouds send rain. So you too have not been right about me, uh, even though he's not as bad as his other three friends. Right. And that's, that's, that's the key. And that's what the book is going to finally end up with is the fact that God is righteous. Job was righteous and he did what was right. Um, his three friends had a lot to learn. And that's, I think, again, that's part of the reason why in this particular place, that's the reason why God had this book written because we deal with this rust. We, we wrestle with this whole idea of evil. And righteousness and why does it seem like the wicked aren't punished why does it seem like the righteous are punished these are things that we need to really come to grips with and and after reading through the book we could sit there and make arguments but a lot of times those arguments may or may not be true it depends on the different person it depends on what's going on in his life and also a lot of it, let's also remember this, a lot of this depends upon God. We could say that a lot of it depended upon Satan, that Satan, what, did all this to Job? And there's truth to that. But God allowed it to happen. And I guess that's the thing that we struggle with as well. Why did God allow Satan to do this? Well, we remember that it was a test. But if, if you're going to go through a test like this, why? Why, God? I thought we were friends. <laughs> Why are you allowing this to happen to me? I think also of the idea that God sent his own son. And think about what he had to put up with from the Jews, from the scribes, the Pharisees. And I keep reminding us of this because this also helps us to understand what he went through on the cross. Think about how all his friends left him as well. All the disciples forsook him and fled. John seems to have come back. It may be that Peter came back too, but out of the 12, the rest of them are hiding for their own lives. We need this book. We need these lessons. So we pick up into chapter 21. He's taken on the major issue now. And again, after this, after this idea, this con controversy seems like it becomes a little bit feebler. And finally, the friends are silenced and God speaks. And so this is where, like I said, we're entering the last cycle of speeches. Bildad does not speak anymore. So this is the other two friends spoke here. We see that Bildad is not speaking. So he goes on and notice the chapter here, verses one through three. 
Job is going to ask for their attention to what he has to say. And then he emphasizes the idea, after you've heard me, keep on mocking. <laughs> you know, he's had it. He's tired. He's sick. He, he's just hurting. And he says, I'm going to say this then just keep on mocking. Beginning in verse four and going through verse six, he's in going to make the point. He says, look, I'm not making, my complaint is not to you. And this is the reason why you should have kept silent. So we're going to actually get into the big question, verse 7, and going through verse 34. Why is it that the wicked do seem to prosper? And why is it that the righteous, like me, have to suffer? And again, this is something that we have to wrestle with. So let's go into the text. Job answered, listen carefully to my speech. Let this be your comfort, your consolation, your your point. Bear with me that I may speak, and after I have spoken, keep mocking. So now Job has kind of dismissed their speeches. They've mocked him. He doesn't want to hear anything else they've got to say. And at the same time, this is the way he looks at it. You've been mocking me. Hear diligently. Listen to me attentively. And again, let this be your consolation. In other words, what I want you to think about is what I'm going to say, and I want you to really think about this. You've come for the purpose of consoling me, verse 2, comforting me. Now let me, as it was, comfort you. You failed miserably to comfort me. So now he tells them if they will listen to him, he will. if you'll just listen to me, that in and of itself will be a comfort. Sometimes when people are going through bad things, they don't need us to tell them anything. They just need us to listen. They just need us to listen. We, again, as I've said over and over and over again, we want to solve people's problems, but we can't. All we want to really solve their problems is God and them. That's it. So he's, he's making this point. You know, if you'll listen, let that be a consolation. And that will bring me some comfort that you've listened to me, that you haven't made any assumptions. Just listen. Just listen. And so he says, suffer me that I might speak. Bear with me that I may speak. In other words, uh, allow me without interruption. That's all I'm asking. Resume your reproaches after I'm done. I'm not going to convince you of anything. You're not going to convince me of anything. I'm sure that after I get finished, I'm expecting mockery and derision again. Just listen. Just listen. So again, his main complaint is not to man, and they should have kept silent. As for me, is my complaint against man? If it were, why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. Even when I remember I am terrified and trembling takes hold of my flesh. So there he brings out this point. You should have kept silent. My complaint is not to you as much as it is to God. Job is still struggling with understanding this. So that's what he's trying to emphasize. The least you could have done was sit silently, provide some measure of comfort like you did the first seven days, but you didn't. And again, if, if you look at me and be astonished, you said, why should I not be impatient? Is my complaint against man? Why should I not be impatient? Since my cause is with God, I have the right to solitude, and I have the right for God to answer why I'm having to go through this. And again, I think Job maybe takes a little bit more because whenever we ask God to give us an answer for something, what are we doing? In essence, we're judging what God has done, we're judging the wisdom that God has had in doing what he has done. And in essence, we become the judge of God. And we forget that our place is not to judge God, but to submit to God in whatever way he chooses to get our attention, to get back to doing what we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes we hurt so bad whenever that happens 
And again, I think about so many times, has God left us? Has God left us when we go through something that hurts so deeply and the hurt just gets so deep? Why did God leave us? I thought we were doing his will. We're preachers, we're elders, we're deacons. We've done all of this. Why, why did God do this? God doesn't have to answer to us. God doesn't have to answer to us and we need to always keep that in our mind. So again, this is the point. Mark me, listen, verse five. Look at me and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. I have been pious. I have prayed to God. I've done all that he's asked. Look at me. I've suffered for seemingly no reason. And I ask yourself, how can this be? How can this be? Another thing is maybe he's doing here is he's saying here, in essence, he's trying to emphasize to his friends about this whole idea of, of what he's going to say. He, I want you to listen and be as attentive as possible to what I'm about to say. Lay your hand on your mouth. Don't say another word. <laughs> just listen. Sometimes when you put your hand on your mouth, you're just, I've seen it a lot of times, people are just in awe. Wow, amazement, right? Um, we don't want them to speak or interrupt. He's making his argument. So he's saying, just leave me alone. He said, even when I remember, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm terrified. It causes me to shudder of the prosperity of wicked men. Job is going to talk about how many wicked men prosper. We don't have to even think about it in this respect. We don't even have to think about it from the viewpoint of Job. All we've got to do is look in our culture today. It seems like that there are many wicked men that prosper. But well, wouldn't you, okay. wouldn't you like, I would be worse if God just struck someone down when they made a mistake that that would be way worse right like rather than he's giving people time to repent that's right and if that was the case josh we wouldn't be here to discuss these things would we <laughs> if god yeah, would, yeah you, you're exactly right but god does give us repent because he thinks that highly of us so again he's stressing this idea i'm trembling takes hold of my flesh so he could be talking again about why he's suffering and the righteous or wicked don't. And so this gets us where we start talking about the wicked. Do they prosper? Yes. Yes. Do a lot of people do things wrong and just seem like they're just prospering and everything's great for them in this, in this life? Yes, they do. Think about these wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people and think about all the sins that they commit. Think about how some of the decisions some people make in higher echelons. And I'm not even talking about government. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about when, when certain people like Bill Gates or, or some of these rich people make certain decisions for their business, it could mean the layoff of thousands of people. It could mean that a lot of people are going to be suffering and hurting because this man has made a decision to do that. And this man is prospering and he still has got more money than he could ever possibly think of in his own life. Billionaire. We're not even talking about millionaires. We're talking about billionaires and make a decision and ruin a lot of people's lives because of that decision. I feel bad for them. I feel bad for, for, I appreciate what you're saying there, Josh, and you're right. We should feel bad for those that are making those kind of decisions. They will have to give them a chance. I feel bad for them having lots of money. More <laughs> of a curse than it is. More of a curse than it is a blessing. In a lot of situations, you're exactly right. It is more of a curse because there's more responsibility that comes with it. So let's see what he has to say. Verse 7 through 15. Why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. Their descendants are established with them in their sight. Their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bulls, their bull breeds without failure. Their cow, calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and harp and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth 
And in a moment, they go down to the grave. Yet they say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? What profit do we have if we pray to him? And their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. Now, this is the way Job is looking at the situation. Why do the wicked live? This has been a question for all ages. If God is just, and this is what this whole discussion has centered upon, if God is just, then why do the wicked live and prosper? Well, there's some answers. The Bible gives us some answers. Number one, sometimes the wicked live because of the forbearance and long-suffering of God. Think about the idea that God is long-suffering. If it were not for that, this world would have already been destroyed. And think about the idea that God does put up with a lot. Think about putting it into a 20th century, 21st century context, all the people that are in prison, all the crimes that they've done, and yet they're still alive. Think about how many, many times, if you're rich, whether you wind up in prison or not, it really depends upon how good an attorney you buy, right? Yeah. I'm being honest about it. I'm not pulling no punches here. I'm just being honest about mm -hmm. it. You think about the idea, as I said earlier. Sometimes people are falsely accused, though. Yeah. Sometimes. That's right. That's right. We have to understand that. Thank you for keeping me on track there, brother, <laughs> making sure that I don't falsely accuse somebody. Secondly. No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying it does happen. Yes, it does. You're right. You're right. So first, God sometimes allows these people to li pro or live because of his forbearance and his long suffering. Secondly, he allows them to live to furnish a full illustration of some human hearts. When people have plenty of money, what do they do with it? And we're going to see again in Job chapter 29 and following, Job's going to talk about how the money that... I, okay. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go, go ahead. I was just going to say, don't you think this is like the, the potter, the vessel, like why are they allowed to live? I think that's misinterpreted, but I think this is what it actually means. In the same context of what he's using right there, why aren't they destroyed? It's the same context that the Jew would use it and say, well, why are these people not destroyed? Why do these Gentiles even live long enough to be converted to Christianity? You know, and that's the context I think that he was using. It. Don't you think? Yeah, I think it could easily dwell into that, that respect. Absolutely. We do know that the Jews thought that God, whenever, especially as they're, you're talking about the land of Canaan and so forth, that God did punish those other nations by destroying them. But the Jews also made a mistake in the fact that they did not obey God. And so that, that comes into play as well. So but yeah. I mean, don't you think, don't you think it's like that Romans, I think it's Romans eight or nine that people are always talking about. Don't you think this is like, it goes right along with it. Yeah, Romans, eight and nine, Romans 1 and 2, where he talks about all the Gentiles, as well as Romans chapter 2, talk about all the Jews. What's he trying to do in chapter 3? He's saying all men are sinners. All men need God. Yeah, but he said, he says, the, 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 why are the, those vessels created for evil? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what he's saying here. Is right. He's saying, why are these people that are evil allowed to live? Mm -hmm. And in the long run, there was a lot more to it the long run they were saved we're saved yeah and that's that could be part of it as well thank you thank you i think another reason again is to give a full illustration of some human hearts the human heart has a wide range through here doesn't it you've got the righteous that are striving to do what god says you've got the person that's trying to kind of be in the middle you've got the sinner that's just out and out sinning You've got people that are rich, very rich, using whatever they wish to do or, or whatever they want to use their money for. You've got others that are very, very poor that could use the wealthy man's money. Um, you, you've got all of this going on. So again, it's, Job was a very rich, rich man. The Bible would say going again back to Job chapter one, he was the wealthiest man in the East. Job had the heart of a servant. 
We're going to see that in Job chapter 29. But others don't. So again, God, Job was using what God gave him to bless others. Others are just keeping and amassing their wealth for what purpose? For what purpose? I think it's also God did not destroy because he's given these people ample space for repentance. And again, the time is going to come for accounting so that they can't blame it on him. And number four, God intends to use some of them, the rich people, to carry out his purposes. Think about the idea of why did God give government? God gave government so that we would have control. But again, there are certain men that get in the office that God uses both ways. Both ways. Can we really pluck the mind of God and try to understand why? Why did God allow a fellow by the name of Hitler to take over Germany and do what he did? And of course, we all, you know, it was World War II, and so we did what we could to defeat the Germans, as well as the Japanese, and you know, all the things that were going on at that moment in time. But think about the cost of lives. I don't know. I was going to say, he, he did a, probably worse things to, to the Jews in a lot of ways. That's exactly right. That's exactly I was going to say, like, he really did, though. Kind of. Yes, he did. And, and again, we, we asked the question, why did he allow that to happen? I don't know that we can answer all of these questions. But at least Job is trying to wrestle with these things. Job is trying to wrestle with how the wicked seem to prosper. Is this before the flood or after the flood? Again, we don't know. We don't know exactly the date, the date of this book. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of questions. Again, it seems to be, as we go back to the first lesson, it seems to be put in the patriarchal age. Whether it's before the flood or after, we are not certain. We are not certain. Different books or different commentaries suggest this may have been the first book written. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we, it's, it's hard for us to even begin to try to sit down and say anything about that. We don't know. We possibly um, don't know. Um, Brother Tindale? Yes. Tindale? Uh, just in terms of the, we think that we suffer a lot. I think one of the things that we need to, to consider is that the greatest suffering is not necess is not really physical suffering. Right. The greatest suffering is only spiritual suffering. And the fact that the greatest suffering that any entity has ever experienced is the fact that God suffered in giving us his son. That's and right. I think sometimes we, we, we lose sight of that because we think, oh, how could this happen? And how it's so grievous that the righteous are doing that. But remember that God being God, and he's continuing. He, he talks about God is long suffering. Mm -hmm. What I, yeah, what I usually think about is that if I hurt you, it's just for a minute and it's not very. But can you imagine if there are 60 billion or million people in the world that every second of the day we are wronging God and causing him hurt? So sometimes I think we need to look at that. That's a very good point. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So the point that he makes here, again, coming back to chapter 21, is the idea that then why is it, why is it that the wicked live? Now, his point of making this, you know, so far had been saying that the wicked would be cut down in his life. And Job is saying, no, it's not always the case. Some of them live. Some of them live to be old. And some of them, you know, if it's the case that people are cut down or destroyed or punished because of their sins, there wouldn't be any old people, right? There wouldn't be any of that. And again, what you're saying, Brother Fisher, is exactly right. God allows us to live, to give us plenty of time. And again, especially this side of the New Testament, this side of the cross, we understand he's given us even that many more opportunities to accept uh, Christ on his terms and to do what the Lord wants and expects of us to do, to be saved and to continue in that saved state. So I think these things are all important. So he says, Job is saying to him, he said, if, it is, if what you're saying is true, then why are there, <laughs> look at it this way. If the wicked are cut down, why is there anybody left on the earth? Right? Mm -hmm. Think about that for just a few moments. And one day we do know that that judgment will come and he will punish all the wicked. 
But that's the point I think Job is trying to make right here, you know, and not only that, but he says, some of them become mighty in power. And I think again about the Bible, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh in Rome. Um, I mentioned this earlier, Adolf Hitler. Um, and whenever I first taught this class, <laughs> this will date myself a little bit, the Ayatollah Khomeini, if you remember in Iran and Iraq, uh, the Ayatollah, he was the guy, he was the evil one. And again, it began the Iran Iraq war and we got involved in the middle of all that stuff. Okay. So the thing is, is we've always had these kind of people with us and Job is making the point. If what you're saying is true, how can there even be a human being here on this planet anymore? Because we've all seen it. So he makes a valid point there. He makes a very good point. He goes on. He said, verse uh, eight, he said, their descendants are established with them in their eyes and their offspring before their eyes. No doubt as Job was saying in that, he's probably thinking about his own family, their seed, and they're always around them to uh, where they could always see them. Now, again, Job's friends have been saying to Job all along that if Job's children had sinned they deserve and got what they deserved remember that and the thing is is he's saying you know it's not that way i've lost my family and i've not done anything to deserve this and if you remember going back again to job one and two he would actually offer sacrifices for them lest they had sinned right so looking at it from that viewpoint again you're, you're not making a great argument here. Notice he goes on. Their offspring are before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Again, he's trying to emphasize that Eliphaz and some of the others had said all along that the wicked man would never be safe from fear. They said that in chapter 20, verse 27, 28, chapter 15, verse 21 through 24. Job is saying, no, 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 no just because the wicked men live their lives in security and peace. And it seems like that their houses are protected from the evil minded man. Okay. And neither is the rod of God upon them. In other words, God's punishment upon them. God doesn't punish them. So as I'm looking at this whole situation here, why am I going through this? Because I can give you examples of many rich, wealthy, Wicked men. Why am I going through this? He goes on verse 10. Their bulls breed without failure and their cows calve without miscarriage. Again, a lot of wealth at that time was dependent upon how big cattle herds they had, sheep, folds they had, so forth. And again, the idea is that the wicked man is prospered with all of this. And again, they send forth their little ones like the flock. He says... Um, and their children dance. Uh, very little children go out to frolic and play with no fear. They play with them like a flock. It's kind of like sheep playing. You, you see the baby sheep, the lambs play. You see the little calves playing. <laughs> They're not worried about anything. They're not worried about being slaughtered. They're not worried about anything. He said, just think about that. And think about again, looking at it from Job's viewpoint, he's also saying what? Uh, like a flock, happy, free-spirited play of boys and girls on the playground or in the fields. Man, it's beautiful. So Job is not condemning these things. Let's remember that. He's not condemning this. He's just saying, you have been saying that the wicked are going to be punished, but I'm saying that, that doesn't happen. He said, verse 12, they sing to the tambourine and harp and rejoice to the sound of the flute. Okay, so that, you know, again, thinking about the idea, instruments of cheerful music. Again, their house, one of contentment and peace. They don't have anything to worry about. Happiness, there's no woe at their house. The wicked prosper, the righteous suffer. Again, this is not par for the course. This is just the exception. Sometimes the wicked do suffer. Sometimes they wind up losing everything they have they go from riches to rags it does happen 
So we're not making a statement, and Job is not making the statement, that this applies to all the rich people. But he's saying, you know, when you look at this, you're saying that I'm wicked, and that's the reason why I've done what I've done. But look at all these rich people that have not hurt or done anything in what they're doing. Don't, don't we supposed to pray for the wicked, though? Yes, we should. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, pray that their hearts may be changed. That's right. Notice verse 13. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. In other words, they don't have some long protracted illness like I've had. They're not sitting around scraping themselves from, from all the things that they're having to deal with like I have. They die like that. They're going into the grave. It's over. It's done. And, and again, you know, they have the abundance of the good things in this life and they die without suffering. They just die. They just, that's the end of it. Therefore, they say unto God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. They're telling God, God, and this, he's still talking about the wicked. God, we don't need you. We don't need you. They're so happy and joyous. Everything's their way. They don't have anything to do with God. Now, they're not actually saying this probably, but their conduct acts like it. Sometimes the hardest people to teach the gospel to are the rich. They've got everything. Poor people are more willing to listen to the gospel because they don't have any, anything. And they're wanting some hope, some help, some way or another, something that's going to give them some encouragement somehow or another. So that's what he, he's emphasizing to them. In fact, the rich are desiring that God just leaves them alone. I don't want to think about the fact that God exists, that I have to answer to him one day. And that's, you know, that's it. God still does not punish them in this life to try to get their attention. The old adage that we look for God in times of adversity is true. It is true. I mean, whenever we really suffer, whenever we're really struggling, that's when we look for God. That's true. I was saying these people are not looking for God because they're not suffering. They're not suffering. Verse 15, what do they say? Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? What profit do we have if we pray to Him? Now, those of us that are Christians, we understand the Almighty from what we read in Scripture. We understand that our purpose here on this earth is to serve Him and to honor Him with our lives, with our lips, with every part of our being. And, and the thing is, is that, it, <clears throat> and He's asking this, you know. Is God really over the wicked? Is God really over the rich? You know, does God exercise dominion over us? Why should we bow down to his authority? Because he's God. I, uh, when, he, when he says counsel of the wicked, I know there's a couple of verses like that somewhere else. Um, you think that means like we're not supposed to take advice from any sinners? Is that what that means? I mean, I believe that kind of, but. In, in some I ways, believe. right, in, in the fact that we don't need to, to listen to them. But again, it depends on the context, depends on what the asked question is. In chapter 22, verse 18, he says, the counsel of the far, wicked is far from me. And he said that again in chapter 22, verse 18, that he did right here. So he said their prosperity is not in their hand. The idea is, is that, you know, why should we even think about God? We have everything that we've made or everything that we have. You, you listen to the rich people. Look what I've done. Look at my wealth. Look at all of that. The rich young ruler will, according to the parable of Jesus, talk about, I have no need of anything. Eat, drink, and to be merry, for tomorrow we die. And immediately, Jesus says, one comes and says, you fool. Today, today you will have to answer. And everything that he has in this life, he leaves behind. He dies. He dies. And you see, that's kind of what, again, Job is saying right here in this place. We don't want to hear anything about God. We don't want to do anything. Why should we even serve him? They don't know, or they have forgotten that God is the one who made them. And again, we realize that God made us for a purpose so that we would be in his image. They ask the question, what good is it if we pray to him? 
What good is it we, we pray to him? And again, men are influenced by their self whenever they inquire about God. They ask not what is right, but what advantage it gives them. Why should I become a Christian, somebody says. Why? I have home. I have wealth. I have health. Everything's going good for me. Why should I become a Christian? Why should I, why should I bother with that? They will think about this idea. If they see no immediate benefit in worshiping God, they will not do it. Now, as we think a lot about this idea of faith as Christians, I've not seen heaven. I think there are some glimpses of descriptions of heaven in some places of the Bible. But I think, again, the descriptions of heaven trying to explain a place like that to us here on this earth is beyond our comprehension. You know, when we come to the end of the Bible and we talk about the street of gold, walking on a street of gold, we can't even begin to imagine what that's like. But that's, I think, again, God is using these terms to try to help us to understand what it's going to be like. We go on and see a little bit further. <clears throat> Men ought to serve God because it's right in and of itself. What are some advantages of serving God? Pardon of sin, peace that the world cannot give. You know, a rich man, a lot of times, they die young because they're always worried about their riches. They're always looking at the stock ticker and seeing if their stock are going down or going up. They're always wondering if they're going to lose a lot of money. The last thing they want to do is that because that's what they think is really life is all about. Another advantage in serving God is he's going to be there when we go through trials. Was God with Job all through this thing? Yes, he was. Did Job realize it? Well, at times it seems like he feels like God forsook him. But he also knows because of his faith in God that God made a promise to him that he would never going to leave him. So you know, whenever you, again, you're in these kind of situations, these are the problems you deal with. Salvation of friends, you know, and hopefully eternal life. So this is what it's all about. So he goes on in verse 16 through 21. Their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. Remember he said that earlier. How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them? The sorrows God distributes in his anger. They're like straw before the wind, chaff that a storm carries away. They say, God lays up one's iniquity for his children. Let him recompense him that he may know him. Let his eyes see his destruction and let him drink the wrath of the Almighty. For what does he care about his household after him when the number of his months is cut off in half? So let's look at the, what he's trying to say here now very quickly. Their good is not in their hand. In other words, everything that you have, everything that I have, is given to us by God. A job to be able to make money, to be able to buy a car, to be able to work the job, that's because of God's providence, okay? God gives us a lot, and we a lot of times take it for granted. We go to bed at night, Lord, uh, forgive us of our sins, and we take it for granted that God has forgiven us because we've asked it. Hopefully, we've repented. We think about the next morning we wake up planning our day. How many of us really think about God as we plan our day? Hopefully, we're all thinking about that in that respect. So as we're looking at this, we have to remember that they do not acknowledge him. They still prosper, but God does not punish them. Another way to look at this is kind of be Job is saying this facetiously. In other words, Oh, see how, do you see how the wicked suffer? You see their calamities? I haven't seen anything. No, you haven't either because they're not suffering for what they're going through. So there's different ways. And again, the only way we could really know the difference on how to interpret this is if we were there to hear maybe Job's sarcasm or not, okay? The counsel, he says, of the wicked are far from me. I can't understand why the wicked do not suffer. I'm like you. I don't understand it. You've made this assumption about me. I don't understand why the wicked so don't suffer. And again, all those who live holy lives do. I don't understand this. How often is the candle of the wicked put out? He asks. 
He's probably referring to Bildad's statement that the lamp of the wicked is put out very quickly, chapter 18, verse 5. But how often does that happen? Whenever a man sin, is he struck dead immediately? No, we're all still here, right? <laughs> Think about that a minute. We're all still here. If God struck every man on this planet down the moment we sin, there would be no, that would be judgment day, would it not? Would it not? So think about as well. Job is saying it's not universal, but it's not as frequent as you think it is. How often does destruction come upon them? Not very often, Job says. And God distributes his sorrow and his anger. And so he says, verse 18, they're stubble, straw before the wind. They're carried away, all right? Again, they, his friends have been saying, all the wicked will perish and be destroyed. So again, how often are the wicked men a stubble before the wind? Again, how often do you see the bad ones, the wicked ones, and they're blown away? Many times the wicked ones, the bad ones, are the wealthiest ones because they don't care what it takes to get their wealth. They don't care about that. How often is this? How often is this? The wicked men being carried away. There's a lot of passages that talk about this idea. Exodus 15, 7. Uh, Psalms 1, verse 4, Psalms 35, 5, Psalms 83, 13, Isaiah 29, 5, 41, 2. See, all these passages do bring up that. Verse 19, he says, they say God lays up one's iniquity for his children. Let him recompense him that he may know it. So again, there's a lot of interpretations for this. Sometimes this passage may be used by some denominationalists suggesting the idea that the children will inherit the parents' sin. I don't think this is what he's teaching here. He's saying, you know, God, well, you know, the wicked man is prospering now, but God's going to take it out on his children. Is God just in doing that? Will God punish the children of the rich man for the rich man's sins? No, God would not be just in doing that. But notice that the idea is they say, this is what a lot of people are saying, that their, that their children are going to be punished. And let him recompense him so that he may see it. Let his eyes see his destruction. So again, as Job is thinking about his own children, his friends have made that the point. They've sinned somewhere down the line. You've seen it. And I think also implicit in that is the idea, Job, you have encouraged this sin. So they're getting what you deserve. They're getting what you deserve. If that is the case, Job says, why don't you just lay it on the wicked man instead of on his children? Verse 20, let his eyes see destruction. Let them drink of the wrath of the Almighty. Okay. He's repeating their argument so as to let them know he's heard what he's had to say. The wicked man will be impressed more with the tragedy of his sin if he will have to suffer punishment himself rather than watching his children suffer. What pleasure has he in this house after him where the number of his months is cut off in the midst? What good is that going to, if he dies before all that, what good is it? So then he comes to verse 22 through 26. Can anyone teach God knowledge since he judges those on high? One dies in his full strength, wholly at ease and secure. His bale pails are full of milk. The marrow of his bones is moist. Another man dies in the bitterness of his soul. Never having eaten with pleasure, they lie down alike in the dust and worms cover them. So he has answered their assumption that wicked men are punished on this earth and even their prosperity may not be punished. These friends have told Job that this was an established fact. Now Job answers by saying, God does exactly as God pleases. Can anyone teach God knowledge? You gonna teach God knowledge? No man can tell God what to do. <laughs> there's a lot of folks that try to tell God what to do. Lord, this is what's going on in my life. This is what I need to have happen. Uh, no, no. God knows what needs to happen, but that doesn't necessarily mean you know what needs to happen, or I know what needs to happen. So he says, verse 23, he says, one dies in his full strength at ease, you know, the idea is just everything is going good, has plenty of cattle, he's prospering with milk and honey, he's healthy, and he just dies. And everything's going good. 
and another dies in the bitterness of his soul. They live their lives with no ease at all. Job understands that now. Their whole life is wretched. Their spirit is embittered by the misfortune. Think about the ideal of these children. And, and use this as an example. Children born and, and living now in the Ukraine. And their houses are being bombed. And these children are like, why? What's going on? Why, why, are we, why, are, why are our houses being destroyed? Why are we having to run for our lives? But this is the way of war. Think about my dad was in Vietnam. And I've seen those pictures. The children hit with napalm, running down the street naked in such pain, just screaming to the top of their lungs. Children don't deserve that, right? They, they really don't deserve that. But again, think about the idea that as he's saying this, another man dies, never having had pleasure. One man lives, one man dies. Some of them live and they have no pleasure in this life at all. And they ask themselves the question, why live? Many people will kill themselves because of that very reason. They just lie down in the dust. The worms cover them. And so then, 27 through 34, after this, we'll take a break, okay? I know I've been going at it two hours now. So <laughs> after this, we'll take a break. He says, Lord, or look, I know your thoughts and the schemes which you would have wronged me. For you say, where's the house of the prince? Where's the tent, the dwelling place of the wicked? Have you not asked those who travel the road? Do you not know their signs? The wicked are reserved for the day of doom. They shall be brought out on the day of wrath. Who condemns his ways to his face? Who repays him for what he's done? He shall be brought to the grave and a vigil kept over the tomb. The clods of the valley shall be sweet to him. Everyone shall follow him as countless have gone before him. He says, <clears throat> how then can you comfort me with empty words? Since falsehood, faithlessness lies in your answers. All right. I know what you're thinking about me, Job says. I know. First, you imagine me to be a sinner above all. You've made these accusations. You've not come out and charged me with it so much. And he knows they're probably thinking, well, prove your point. Show us a wicked man who's not suffered. And so he just, he just show, you know, show us where a wicked man lives. Show us where he's living and everything's going good for him. Have you not asked him that goes by the way? In other words, have you as opponents, you know, you traveled by the way, ask him, ask him. They were tested the fight of the truth that the, go ask a wicked man, somebody that you know for a fact is doing wrong. Go ask him. And again, you'll find out that they're prosperous and happy. Do you not know that their conclusions, they're reached from their own observations? And here's the crux of the whole matter. Here it is. He says, they will be brought, or they will be brought out on the day of wrath. Job, number one, obviously believes, and we've already talked about this before, that there will be a day of judgment. Number two, he does say that they will be punished on that day of judgment. So again, he's emphasized the idea. Here's the crux of the whole matter. Your, his friends were saying punishment should come now. Job is saying, not necessarily, it will come on the day of judgment whenever God does say that's that. And they shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. So what's he saying? The wicked do not always suffer here. And often they are at ease and prosperous. And secondly, there will be a day of reckoning of right and wrongs. Now, this again is something that amazes me. If Job was written in one of the first books of the Bible by Moses, even here, this early in the Bible, we have the prediction of the second coming. We have the prediction of the day. So again, this is something to, that's something in and of itself to sit down and look, see how many times in the Old Testament, there are passages that do refer to this day of judgment. He said, who shall declare his way to his face? In other words, who's going to charge and punish him here? Nobody. Nobody's going to charge the wicked with his guilt. Again, the sinner has no shame or fear. One day he's going to have to pay. They shall be brought to the grave, shall remain in the tomb. Again, even in his death, he's, he's 
is, is brought honor to the grave. Think about again, some of the bigger tombs and how they're brought to honor. But think about the poor man that is hastily buried and forgotten in an unknown grave somewhere. So again, the friends are watching over the rich man's tomb. They don't care about the poor. The clods of the valley shall be sweet unto him. Every man shall draw after him and they're innumerable before him. In other words, you know, everybody's going to go down that road, right? He shall lie as calmly as others in the grave. It's hard for us when we lose somebody that we love to think about them in a grave or having been cremated. The body's not there anymore. And sometimes we struggle with the separation of the soul and body. We understand that's what death is. And we keep, you know, uh, especially a lot of folks that go visit graves, they think, well, that's where so-and-so is buried, but their spirit's going back to be with God. How many folks go talk to their parents or somebody else that's already in the grave? like their parents are hearing them like they were here on this earth. Think about it again. People will go see the graves of prominent people, the tomb of the unknown soldier, and the grave of John F. Kennedy, or some of these other places because of the person that's lying in the grave. He says, you know what? They're innumerable. Many people have gone this road, but the bottom line is, how can you comfort with empty words? Place your comfort on the truth is what he's trying to tell them. If it's based on falsehoods, you're not going to get anywhere. So seek your comfort in truth. And that's what he's trying to say to them. All right, it's eight o'clock. Let's take about a five minute break, at least five minute break, maybe a 10 minute break. Okay. I got to wet my whistle a little bit more. I will, I will pause the recording and we'll come back in about five or 10 minutes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. We're back. Uh, ten minute break made us feel a little bit better. Get up, walk around a little bit. Job chapter twenty two. Now this begins the last cycle of speeches, and again in this cycle the arguments are not very convincing. In every week, in every sense of the term, they can't attack the argument. So if you can't attack the argument, you attack the man. <laughs> And listen to politicians as they're arguing or debating with one another in a debate. Listen to different people as they're doing that. And more often than not, you will find them going back to the ideal of attack the man, not what he believes. And this is kind of a, this is an interesting chapter in the fact that again, um, <clears throat> he makes this point verses one through three, Eliphaz does. He makes the point about the unprofitableness of man to God um and on the slide importance of job's case in other words god is so great he doesn't have time to really pay attention to job that much and then think about it well as all of us in a sense are unprofitable to god we all sin we all don't always do what we're supposed to be doing he then goes on and says he starts verses four through nine he starts talking about and starts giving specific sins that he thinks job has done and we've seen this before but it's again, direct charges of sins, verses four through nine. He says, next, he says, verses 10 and 11, these sins are the reason why you're suffering. Same song, second verse, different words. And then as we've already seen, some of the words are repeated time and time again. Some of the accusations are repeated time and again. We see in verses 12 through 14, he denies or he charges Job with denying God's omniscience. And the idea of the fact that God knows everything and that by your saying that you've not sinned, you're saying that therefore God is not aware of what you've done. He will go on in verses 15 through 20, starts trying to give some answer to what Job has said. But again, this kind of just doesn't work out the way it needs to. And finally, he, verses 21 through 30, Job, you need to repent. Verse 21, you acquaint yourself with him. Acquaint yourself with him. What do you mean? Get to know God. <laughs> well, this whole discussion has been about God. Job has made very clear arguments. Many times he has talked to God himself, 
And, and the thing is, acquaint yourself with God? Really? Are you actually challenging me to do that? Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. So let's talk about verses one through four. Eliphaz, the team and I had answered, said, can a man be profitable to God? Though he who is wise may be profitable to himself, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Is it gain to him that you make your ways blameless? So again, what he's setting out to do here, he's setting up a straw man. And a lot of times whenever you attack people or attack an argument, you try to set up a straw man, a man that is easily refuted, is easily torn down. And the idea is that he seems to be saying if what Job has said was true, that God does not deal with man according to their deeds now, that it must be that God feared the wicked man or would gain if he prospered the man. The idea is, is the only reason God is allowing the wicked man to hang in there and be blessed the way he does is because either God fears the wicked man or the wicked man is giving God something as, as a result. Now, we all know the absurdity of that whole idea. God doesn't need man. God created man because that's what he wanted to do, but he doesn't need man. He doesn't need any man. And so he then points out that this cannot be so. And by doing that, he refutes the argument. So he builds a straw man saying, you're saying that we don't need God. And now I'm going to just tear him down. Well, that's, you're tearing down a man that you have made, not what the truth of the reality of the situation is. So let's look at it. Can a man be profitable to God? Though he who is wise may be profitable to himself. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Or is it gain to him, he says, to make your ways blameless? Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? So again, they're getting it right. Verse four, God is the one who is allowing this to happen to Job. And they're making the assumption that he's done something wrong. So Job, is he saying, in essence, can you really be, a, can you really live a life that's profitable to God? Well, hopefully we should be, right? We should be honoring God. We should be praising him for who he is. And we should be helping others to know him. There's something to be said about that. But the points making making here, God is, God doesn't need man. God has existed in eternity. He decided somewhere in eternity to create man. Up to that point in time, he never had man to have a relationship with him. So when you start thinking about it in those broad ideas, does he need us? No, he doesn't. Why then did he create us? Because he wanted, obviously, some thing, I guess for lack of a better term, that is like him. He did not give spirits to the animals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He gave spirits to man, and he allows man to choose. A lot of people do believe that animals are on the same level as man, and what they're doing is bringing man down on the level evolutionary scale to try to bring man down to that. But can animals really think about what's right and what's wrong? The only thing that animals think about whenever something's right or wrong is if I'm being punished for it or if I'm getting food for doing it. That's it. That's their motive. If I get food for doing this, then I'll keep on doing this. But if not, I'm not going to do it. If I'm punished for doing this, I may stop it. But it's like a child. I may stop it. But I, whenever you're not around, I'm going to do it anyway. You know what I'm saying? That's the way animals are. They, that's the way God made them. So the thing is, as you look at that, can you really be profitable to God? He don't need man. He that is wise may be profitable unto himself. A wise man may sit there and argue that he is profitable to himself, but he can't really make the argument that he's profitable to God. Okay? The point is God is not dependent upon man. So God punishes as he sees fit. Okay? Now, Think about this. As we look at this later, God is going to say some things about these friends to Job that they were not talking right about him. So start, let's, let's start looking about some of the things that he said about him so far. And, and I think this gets too close to where we're talking about in that respect. He says, is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you're righteous? 
<laughs> in other words, if you are as righteous as you say that you are, does God really need that? Is it any pleasure for that? God is not profited when a man is righteous. His happiness does not depend on whether or not we're, we're righteous or not. God does not owe us anything. He did not Job, Job anything. So, you know, how do we feel about some man? How do we feel that man is so pious, holy, that God can't do without him? God, you know, we need to trust him, not ourselves. There is a sense that God is pleased with righteousness. Amen. Psalms 147, verse 11, Psalms 149, verse 9, 4. When we do what's right, we are bringing honor and praise to God. Animals do what they do, not because they know the difference between right and wrong, but because of what they're trained to do. We, however, make decisions. We make those choices. And we're profitable to God when we live up to according to his commandments. So he says, <clears throat> um, let's see, where am I? Verse 3. Is it any gain to him that you make your ways blameless? No. So Eliphaz, he's, again, he's built a straw man. And he said, in essence, Job, you know, Job hadn't said anything about this, but he's taken up something Job has not said and answered it. So will he reprove thee for fear of thee? In other words, uh, the bottom line is, is that, you know, God is reproving you not for your, not for his fear of you, but for the fact that you fail to fear him, to respect him. And so this is the evidence of your guilt. This is the reason why we know that you're guilty because he has entered into you into judgment. Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you? No, no. Obviously then it has to be what? You've done something wrong. You've done something wrong. So here it gets to the litty gritty. Is not your wickedness great? Is not your iniquity without end? All righty. Now he's going to get specific. You have taken pledges from your brother for no reason. You've stripped the naked of their clothing. You have not given the weary water to drink. You have withheld bread from the hungry. Now, where did they get that? I mean, honestly, where did they get those ideas? They're trying now to think the worst possible thing of him and accuse him of this. And this is what we often do so often, right? Think about even in the church. I don't mean to be ugly about this, but let's be honest about this a little bit, okay? Somebody, you and I maybe have a difference of opinion about something. And we're going to sit there and argue about it up one side. And it sometimes maybe because of that, that argument may become a little bit heated. And so what do we do a lot of times? Well, if we do it the way the Bible tells us to, we ought to go back to one another, repent, and get our act together. Amen. But we don't always do that. We get other brothers and sisters to take our side against you. And you get brothers and sisters to take your side against me. And what begins to happen? Uh, division starts in the church. Uh, brother uh, yeah. Tommy, I have to laugh because it's it's like they're trying mm -hmm. in order to justify their argument. They're trying to create cases Mm -hmm. that would say, yes, Job, this is the reason. Yeah. But each case sounds so absurd. You know, it's, it's you do it because you didn't feed the poor, because it didn't give. I mean, where did, as I said, where did they get that from? But you see, they have to find something right. to justify their action. I, I find it very funny. <laughs> I do too. And, 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 and you know, as I was saying a moment ago, we do the same thing in the church. Whenever we don't like somebody, we try to find something somewhere that will justify our statement of them and our reason for writing them off. And it's, you know, but it's in, in one fa fact, you're right, brother, it's funny. In another fact, it is so sad because they have to resort to this. They have to resort to making something up. And that's what's the tragedy of the whole, whole thing is. And that's what they've been trying to say all, all, all along anyway. So he, he just says, you know what? He says, <clears throat> your iniquities are without end. <laughs> you, you have sinned so much. Now, let me give you some examples. And again, where in the world, where in the world did he get this stuff? Did he make it up? Yeah, yeah. He just made it up because he's got to find a justification for what he's saying. Hey, okay. Tommy. Yes. Do you, 
uh, <clears throat> do you think that maybe sometimes like a lot of people today, maybe that's what's going on here is like these people are not giving him a whole lot of their time. Maybe they're just like, oh, uh, well, let me see if I can fix your problem in a couple of minutes or something like that. That's what it kind of seems like. Yeah, and that's what we do more often than not. We see somebody in a bad situation. We automatically assume they did something to get themselves there. We talked about this. They've done drugs or something somewhere down the line. They made bad decisions. And then we can sit back and justify why we don't spend a lot of time with them, trying to help them become, be become better. We also sometimes make the worst possible assumption about them, just like his friends were doing. And all of this comes back into play here. Exactly. You're exactly right. So this is, it's now they all up to this point in time, it seems like that they have, they've made some pointed accusations, a couple of them, but here in life ass, he, he's, he's pulling out all the punches. Okay. He's pulling out all the punches and he's, he's telling, he said, this is what you're doing. This is what you've done, Joe. Here it is. You've taken a pledge from your brother without cause. Deuteronomy 24 10 says that if a poor man came to you and offered you his cloak in return for something, then that evening, that evening when he came back, you are to give his pledge back to him because he sleeps in that coat. He sleeps in that. See, that's where he stays warm. That's how he's able to sleep and so forth. So you're not to hold that pledge. You're not to hold that promise when that man needs it. So here he says, you've taken a pledge of thy brother for nothing. He's stabbing in the dark. You know, it's a security for a dead owned. And they would a lot of times, because they didn't have anything else, they would take a man's clothes and <laughs> not get them back by sundown. And again, this was something, Deuteronomy 24, verse 10, that God condemned and said, no, no, you give him his pledge back until he does pay you off. You, because again, that's what he sleeps in. All right. So their ideal is what? Job, you've taken pledges for your brother for no reason, and you stripped the naked of their clothes. You, they didn't even have nothing to begin with, and you've taken what they had away. Man, really? They're just making him just as po the worst possible person that you could ever possibly be. Now, brothers and sisters, or brothers, we've got to remember and think about this idea that, you know, we, we should not be guilty. We should have our eyes wide open to try to help those that, are in hurting that hurting hey, well in the old testament that hospitality is a big deal it is it is a very very big deal and again it's more than just taking somebody out and getting them something to eat but helping them find a place to stay or, or maybe even taking them into your own house and let them stay there for a while that was the old testament idea notice he says uh you've stripped your brother you've stripped the naked of their clothing you've not given the weary water to drink Again, you have any, you see somebody that's thirsty and you won't even give them something to drink. Everybody can do that. You have withheld bread from the hungry. Really? Now, I want you to keep this in mind because Job is going to answer every one of these in Job chapter 29. All right? Job is going to defend himself against this, these absurd accusations. So, again, he's making an assumption he can't prove. He remembers that Job had great possessions. He's lost them all. So he's saying, in essence, well, what happened, the reason why you lost everything is because you deserved it because you did these things. And he says, the honorable man dwelt in it, the mighty man possessed the land, your land, and the honorable man dwelt in it. You have sent widows away empty. Again, look at the sorry picture that he paints of this Job. And they were no bother to anyone while their husbands were alive. When, when they needed help, he pictures Job as being so heartless that he turned them away. Job's going to answer this in chapter 29, verse 13. Specifically, he's going to get down to the nitty gritty in 29, verse 13 there. He says the arms are the strength of the fatherless. The fatherless, of course, would have no parents. So their strength was crushed. In other words, you have allowed orphans to be victimized and did nothing to stop it but again chapter 29 verse 11 and 12 and chapter 31 21 and 22 job is going to say i never did that and god's going to say he did that he saved he took care of these people in that respect 
He said the snares, notice the snares and fear is around you. Traps, darkness so that you cannot see and an abundance of water covers you. So you're where you need to be. The ideal is, is that you've been trapped. Now all these calamities have come upon you. What better proof do you need that you have done what I've just said you've done? Wow. Wow. Well, you know, whenever we make assumptions and think that that's the way, and, and again, we do the same thing sometimes. We see a homeless man on the street and we automatically assume either A, he's on drugs, B, he's drinking too much. Um, and so we feel like that we're justified in not helping him in his sin, right? And, and the bottom line is God wants us to care for these folks and help them in every way we can. The church ought to be the one helping them. Now, again, we understand the book of um, when Paul says, uh, I think it's 2 Thessalonians, where he said, if any will not eat, work, neither let him eat. But who's he writing to there? He's not writing. He's writing to Christians there. If you've got Christians in the congregation that won't get out and work and do what they're supposed to do as husbands, as fathers, as workmen, then the church is under no responsibility to help those people if they not won't get out there and do what they need to be doing. Well, they were eating in front of them too. That's what they were doing. Yeah, that's true. They were eating like like really luxurious meals in front of the poor people. Right, and and so that's not that's not what you do for your brothers. That's what he's trying to say there. He goes on and he says there the idea of the the sudden fear, darkness that you cannot see. Darkness is again always emphasizes calamities. And he, Job had often talked about darkness as as some of the things that he had gone through. And so he's emphasizing the idea, the abundance of water coming upon him. It's the ideal of flood. He's being flooded. And again, Psalms 42, seven, Psalm 69, one through three, you're flooded with all of this stuff. So all this has happened to you, maybe not a literal flood, obviously. Uh -huh. This has happened to you because you haven't done what's right. So, he suffered as a result of this. Now, this part, Eliphaz accuses Job of denying God's omniscience. What is omniscience? God knows everything. He knows everything. He knows everything. He knows everything. So he asked the simple question, is God not in the height of heavens? Again, the ideal of these verses is that God looks so ex exalted that he cannot look down on us and judge us now. God or Job had maintained the opinion that God did not punish in the here and now. And from that, Eliphaz inferred, inferred that God was so exalted that he could not attend to worldly matters. You know, there's a lot of people that have the idea that God exists, but they believe he doesn't really care about what man does. Well, that's not biblical. That's not what the Bible teaches, obviously. All through the Bible, it shows how God has intervened in the affairs of man time and time and time and time and time again, because he does care for man. And because he does care about what man is doing and thinking. So again, how often do they, do people have in their religious life, cherished convictions, one man appeals to the facts and the other appeals to a cherished doctrine or belief, you know, that's what often happens. So here he's trying to, in essence, do the same thing. Um, if he appeals to facts, he's denying a very important doctrine. So you know, God is in the height of heaven. He is above the heavens. He is beyond the heavens because he is the creator of heaven and earth. Consider how high the stars are as we think about it. And so he says, consider how lofty they are, verse uh, 12. So, and you say, what does God know? God who created everything, what does God know? Can he judge through dark cloud, through the deep darkness? Thick clouds cover him so that he cannot see, and he walks above the circle of heaven. And again, you're reading this, and you're looking at what he's trying to say here, and he's just saying, are you saying that God doesn't know everything about you? If there's one thing the Bible does teach, he's that God knows everything. He knew when we were going to come on this planet, and he knows our day of death. He knows who we were born to. He knew who we would marry. He knew, he knows everything about us. He knew what job we'd have. He knows everything. And so can you really say, what does God know? Job, 
are you accusing God of doing all these things to you? And in essence saying that uh, God can't know everything? Job, what, what are you doing? What are you saying here? Okay. Job had just stated the fact that man are not always judged in the here and now. Well, that's true. God doesn't always judge in the here and now, right? Do you, you were saying something about doctrine, though, but do you think that they, they, they would all have the same doctrine, right? It would seem like it, because as we go through this entire book, they all would have had the same assumptions. And then Job yeah. was stricken, and all of a sudden, all those assumptions get thrown out the window, except by his three friends who keep bringing these things up to try to make an argument as to why Job is going through what he's going through. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, I think they all held the same beliefs. Job is struggling with it because he may have had the same beliefs and then trying to figure out, okay, I've not done anything to cause this. And the three friends have the same belief and they're accusing him of things that cause God to do this. So as we look at all of this, I think we have to look at it all together and see that, yeah, they probably did have the same views, but they're arguing with one another because Job, Job can't fathom why he's going through what he's going through. I don't know if that helps or not. So Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I was just curious. Yeah. Verse 15, will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod? So again, he's asking the question, are you going to keep down this path you're going? Who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by a flood? They say to God, depart from us. What can the Almighty do to them? Yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. So again, he, he's trying to give an unsuccessful retort on Job's argument. Okay, he's trying to, he's trying to answer Job's argument. Job had maintained that God deals with men in this world according to their character. And again, to meet this, Eliphaz again appeals to the ancient facts and to the reference, probably has a reference to the flood, the judgment of God. So that might answer the question that was there earlier. When was this written? May have been after the flood before or after it was written. Okay. Because some people do think that the flood here he's talking about is the flood. All right. Can't prove it for a fact, but something to be said. Yeah. yeah. Notice he says about those, he says, what can God know? Well, think about it. He judges through the deep darkness. Thick clouds cover him. He walks above the circle of heaven. So he, he then asks, will you keep to this old way? Will you keep on believing what you believe? He said, who were cut down, these wicked men who trod, which cuts down, whose foundation was swept away by a flood. They said to God, depart from us. What can the Almighty do to them? And he's saying, that's exactly what he did to them. What could he do? suddenly forcefully destroyed in a flood in the prime of their lives and again there was no opportunity the foundations were all relied upon their security their happiness rested on that and everything was overthrown with a flood destroyed i think about as and i shared this with you before when we think about this idea of the flood think about how the lives changed and knowing his sons and family after the flood millions possibly billions of people on the earth they're all washed away they're all dead. They're gone. And now they start all over again. And you want to talk about starting all over again. Yeah. They're starting all over again. And he says, yet he filled their houses with good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. I think he's using sarcasm here. You know, he filled their houses with good things. God did fill their houses with good things. But what happened? He destroyed them because of their sin. I think that, don't you think that the counsel of the wicked means is the information is kind of useless too? Like, I don't know. The way he's saying it there. The counsel, I think he's sarc I think it's count, I think it's sarcasm. You claim the counsel of the wicked is far from you, yet you defend their ways. Mm -hmm. You defend their ways, I think maybe is what he's trying to say. I, on the other hand, have no part with any of the wicked <laughs> well uh okay you're trying to convince me so all right the righteous see it and are glad what do the righteous see the righteous see that the wicked are punished 
and the innocent laughs them to scorn. And he says, our adversaries are cut down and the fire consumes their remnant. So think about, again, the ideal of the flood, the ideal of fire, both suggest the ideal of judgment. The That's way I, hell, right? Well, I don't know that it's hell here in this Our context. lake of fire. I don't know that it's hell in this context. Think about how the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire. Yeah. Think about uh, some other places that people were destroyed by fire. So I don't think we could actually say that it has reference to that. Yeah. Um, and that's something to think about. The, the innocent are laughing at the wicked because they're suffering because of that. Um, think about the idea that in the Old Testament, it seems like that the righteous were rejoicing over the destruction of the wicked, right? Um, but in the New Testament, we're called upon to what? We don't rejoice in the destruction of the wicked. We, we should be doing all we can to help the wicked to be saved, right? So I think there's something to be said about that. He said, here, our adversaries are cut down. The fire consumes their remnants. So he, he's just emphasizing the idea that this is it. What do you need to do, Job? What do you need to do? Acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. <laughs> Job, you need to get to know God. So, really? Are you serious? You know, are you really serious? Get to know what God and be at peace. Goodwill will come upon you. Receive instruction from his mouth. Lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the almighty, you will be built up. You will remove iniquity far from your tents and you will lay your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir from the stones of the brooks. The almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. And then you will have your delight in the almighty. Lift up your face to God. He will make your prayer to him. <clears throat> And um, he will hear you. You will pay your vows. You will also declare a thing and so it established for you. So light shall shine on your ways. And when they cast down, they say exultation will come. You will save the humble person. He will even deliver one who is innocent. And he will you'll be delivered by the purity of your hand. So here's his last point. This verse 21 kind of transitions in a sense. This is the point from where he's making, and he hopes that Job will see the error of his ways and repent. And it is a beautiful passage in one sense. Uh, think about what he's saying. Get to know him. Be at peace with him. Thereby, good will come to you. The ideal is the more you have your friendship with God, be reconciled to him, rejoice in him. You know, for us to be in the right relationship with God, we've got to know God's character. We've got to know who he is. And again, where else are we going to know that but from the scriptures? And as we've talked about this through the book of Job, we were already dealt with omniscience and his power and his strength and, and his might and what he knows and what he doesn't know. And, and we have a peak of heaven in chapters one and two where he's having a debate with Satan as to Job's veracity and whether or not Job is going to be faithful. Men need to come to an understanding of God's character. They need to be willing to repent from the love of sin and turn to God. And they need to be at peace. You can't be at peace when you're at war with God. You can't be at peace whenever you're continuing in sin. And the only real peace of mind is whenever we're reconciled to God. So I like what he's saying to him here. He's just saying it to the wrong person. It's all people need to have this peace. All people need to acquaint themselves with God. Um, he just believes that Job needs to do it as well, right? And so he goes on. What are some things that he says in the following verses that if you are right with God, what are some things that's going to happen? Well, jump down. You make your prayer to him and he will hear you. God will hear your prayer. If you're in the right relationship with God, God will hear your prayers. Look at verse 28. Light will be upon his path. All right. Uh, light will shine on your ways is what he says in verse 28. Verse 29. When he casts you down, exaltation will come. He will save the honest or humble person. God will see that that person's vows are paid. All right, well, that's back in verse 27. Uh, Job will then be able to help the sick and the needy and the poor. The guilty will be delivered. He said he will not even deliver one who is innocent, but he will deliver by the purity of your hands. Job, if you just come back to God, you will help others to come to know God. 
how often maybe we make the argument to people that whenever they become Christians, now you need to go out there and teach others about what they need to do to become Christians. And again, we need to do some teaching of them to help them to know and teach what they need to be doing. So what does he need to do? Go back to verse 22. We need to be at peace. And again, whenever you're at peace and you have this confident trust in God, he's going to hear your prayers. He's going to show you light on this pathway. He'll see that his vows are paid. And again, you'll be able to help others and help others to know the truth of God. So what do you need to do? First, receive the instruction from his mouth. Listen to his words. Do what he says. Emphasize the idea again. <clears throat> Lay up his words in your heart. Embrace these truths. Meditate on them. Never let them leave you. Look, that's good words. That's good advice. Lay them up on our hearts. Don't let them leave you. You know, we read and we study and we, we think about these things. We meditate on these things. Always we need to be thinking about this stuff. So embrace the truths. Don't let them leave you. And he said, if you turn return, you will be built up and put iniquity far from your tabernacles. You will be built up instead of being torn down. You will be blessed. You will be blessed. So keep on keeping on. Keep, keep the iniquity far from your tabernacle. Again, in chapter 11, verse 14, Zophar had made the implication that there were ill-gotten gains in Job's tent. <laughs> so if Job repented, all sin will be put away from him. You shall lay up gold as dust. What? Are you saying the Almighty will be your gold? <laughs> no, you will lay up gold as in the dust. Think about that idea. Are you going to be so blessed? How many people today preach that prosperity gospel? If you just turn your life over to God, God's just going to give you gold and silver, and you're going to take care of every little thing you need. And a lot of people listen to that, and they buy into it, and then whenever the problems come back from whatever, the gold's not there, the silver's not there to pay the rent, and everything like that, then they want to give up on God. And it's because they've listened to a false teaching that if you just do what God says, God's going to bless you. Now, don't misunderstand me. God does bless us if we do his will, right? I think the gold is metaphorical in, in the heaven sense. The okay. gold is like, it's, it means like wealth or something like that. You'll be have abundance or something. Right. And you could be right in that respect. It could be used in the metaphor. I mean, what are you going to use gold for in heaven? What would you use it for? You going to buy something with it? <laughs> yeah. Well, you go back to Revelation where some people think that's a description of heaven and the streets are pure gold. And, and you're sitting there like, really? Okay. And that's what a lot of people think, that it's pure gold. So we have I think it's there. trying to describe the glory or something. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the idea. So he, he's saying God will be your gold. Think about this. You lay your gold in the dust, the gold of old for the almighty will be your gold. So really what you really need more than anything else is God. And he's more treasure or he's more valuable to you than gold. And there's a lot of truth to that statement, right? So he says, you know what? He says, you will remove, if you return to the almighty, you will lay up your gold. And, and he said, they will be, will be your gold. Then you'll have your delight in the almighty. You'll be able to lift your face to God and God will hear your prayers. God will hear your prayers. Now, Job had complained of God not hearing his prayers. He asked for death, but it did not come. He begged for a respite from suffering. He didn't get it. He asked God to enter controversy with him. and God didn't answer. And so in all of this, he felt God had forsaken him. And he could never figure out why. Why? And that's the beauty of what we've freed in the last part of the book where he, God comes and speaks to Job and his three friends and emphasizes what they needed to know. He says, you shall decree a thing. If you repent and reconcile yourself to God, God will help you in any plan and purpose you might have. And God will help carry it out. Again, how often is that touted as a good reason to follow God? God's going to, Take your plans and give you everything you need. 
And again, we often more than not, people a lot of think believe that. And then when bad times come, they're ready to walk away from God because they've been told all along that God's going to make sure that nothing bad happens to them. But bad things still happen to good people. Job is the example. Jesus died on a cross. He was perfect. The bottom line is bad things are going to happen to good people. So we have to, and here you go, in Eliphaz's case, you, you hear a lot of the same things that, like I said, we hear from a lot of people today. You come to God, God's just going to bless you, and you're not going to be able to stand everything God does for you. And a lot of times people do that thinking that this refers to, I'll have every need met. I won't need anything else. They're trying to get money out of somebody. That's why. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And so he says, when you are cast down, you will say exaltation will come. God will even, God will save the humble, the person that has suffered the most. So in its answer to your prayers, God shall save and rescue the oppressed person. And he shall deliver one who is not in it. He, he will even deliver one who's not innocent, yet he will be delivered by the purity of your hands. Better the translation of this is he shall deliver even him that is not innocent. The idea is that if a man, if Job returns to God and he shall intercede in behalf of him as Job intercedes for that other person, that God will bless that man whom Job is praying for. God will save the wicked man you pray for. Now, we should be praying for the wicked. We should be praying for those that are out of service to God. We need to understand that. But we don't have a promise that God is going to, like Eliphaz is making here, you don't have the promise that God is going to save that man or anything else. That man's got to make his own decision as to what he's going to do. There's nothing wrong, however, praying. Now, in this book, Job does end up praying for his three friends, right? And God forgives them. God does forgive them. So as we look at all of that, Eliphaz is making this argument and he's trying to tell him for the last time, you know, this is it, Job. This is it. This is what you've got to do. All right, we're going to stop there. Perfect change. Chapter 23, 24. We'll see how far along we can get. Again, we're going to try to get as quickly as we can and uh, we'll keep on going. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Any questions? Thank you. Comments, email me. Huh? Maybe you again? I said, if you have any questions, comments, email me. Uh, okay, we'll do that. And um, I appreciate you both. Appreciate yeah. you. Both. Yeah. Hey, Tommy. Sorry for sending you that like, so, so late. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I, 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 uh, I'll send you the test. I didn't, I didn't finish it today. They, they were working on the internet and all that. I had a bunch of stuff going on. Okay. I'll get it to you though. Is that, is that all right? Okay. That's fine. Take okay. It. Okay. I'm not in a real rush. Just as long as you get it to me before I give you the final. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll do it next time. See what a benevolent dictator I am. I love <laughs> oh, oh yes. Dictator. I don't think yeah, dictator. He, yeah, he's he's just like Job, Job's friends, right? Um, in this case, he's a benevolent dictator, not a um, miserable comforter, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to be a comforter, brother. So yeah, get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All righty, appreciate yeah. you guys. That was a fair test, uh, Tommy. It really was. Yeah, I love teaching this class, and yeah. uh, I got kind of bogged down a little bit, but I, I'm back into it now. And, and thank you guys. You have yeah. me for being here. Thank you. Yeah, we keep praying for you. Thank you. Uh, I need it. We yeah. all. All right. We all do. All right then, brother. Talk to you later. All right then, Joshua. All right. God bless. Thank God you. bless. Bye. Bye bye.